you who are joining us online, on Facebook and YouTube as we stream this service, the Dominion and Life Services from the main campus of uh, Life Christian University here in Tampa, Florida. And uh, I don't know about where you are right now, but we're celebrating that spring has kind of really sprung here because we hit 85 degrees today. I say that's like a heat wave in so many parts of the country, but that's normal for us. I mean, it's like, I like it when it says 85, feels like 85. <laughs> I go, glory to God. It's my kind of temperature. But anyway, now we would be happy to send you all of our oak pollen. Wherever you are, we would just, you know, sweep it all up, bag it up, and send it to you if you want it. But uh, we still have plenty of it here. <laughs> That's why we're praying for the rainy season to come now and <clears throat> help us out, tamp it all down. Praise God. Well, tonight, you know, last week I, I was ministering on um, dominion and life through divine healing. And I have to just tell you something that started happening with me um, just in prayer over the last week. And, the, and it had to do really, remember when we got to the New Year's and I was just saying, something seemed really wrong. I mean, I'm watching the, the ball drop with my daughter because she insisted I stay up to watch the ball drop. And like one minute till midnight, I'm going, how ridiculous is it that everybody's expecting some big change for the year? The sinners, even the demon-possessed people alike, you know, with Christians, and we're expecting it. And we're all pegging it, you know, to when the clock strikes 12 in our time zone. <laughs> and uh, so anyway... So as I was praying this week, the Lord was saying, well, what is your life really about? I said, well, Lord Jesus, Christ is my life, so you are my life. He says, well, when did life begin for you? I said, on resurrection day, the original first resurrection day is where life began for me. And uh, even though, you know, I was born way after that, obviously that's where life really began for everybody who's a Christian. And um, so... I started realizing that, you know, we have um, just these weird anomalies with the, the uh, calendars and stuff, you know. So you know, realize Israel used uh, a, the calendar that was based on cycles of the moon because that's what the Chaldeans had done. <laughs> and Abraham was from Ab the Chaldeans. I mean, he was a moon worshiper. And so anyway, they're just carrying that whole thing. It wasn't like, okay, there's something so holy about calendar based on the moon. But anyway... And of course, when they're going to switch it to everything being surrounding Christ, but instead of from the time of resurrection, they're trying to do it by the birth. So under Pope Gregory, they got, you know, the Gregorian calendar, and they missed it by three and a half years or so. But one thing that we do know, even according to the Gregorian calendar, it would be in the year 30 AD, which was stands for Anno Domini. I was just discussing that with my daughter the other day. She says, so, well, you know, BC doesn't really stand for before Christ. I said, well, we use it that way. I can't even remember what the Latin is. But I, and I said, well, what do, you know, what do you know what AD stands for? And she says, well, yeah, after death. I said, oh, no, absolutely wrong. Anno Domini, which is Latin for in the years of our Lord, you know, the year following the time of our Lord. But rather than focusing on the time that he came when he was birthed, as wonderful as the incarnation is, Eternal life happened on the day of resurrection. And on the day of resurrection, his original uh, disciples of the Lamb, being the apostles of the Lamb, got born again. And so um, the Lord told me, he said, well, what would be the calendar date right now if you went from that day forward? I said, well, you know what? It would be 1994. 1,994 years ago, Jesus was raised from the dead. And we're just coming up, on, I mean, two, in two weeks from now, when we have Resurrection Sunday, that, that will be the year. I'm just starting to count that now is, you know, people will say, well, it's not the Gregorian calendar. I'm calling it the Doug Wingate calendar. I'm just calling it the Doug Wingate calendar of resurrection. I'm just saying it started on AD 30, and today it's going to be in 1994 coming up. So anyway, and we'll have our 2,000th birthday in six years from now. But uh, And it just kind of reminds me of positioned by those 30 years that, you know, DJ will be turning 30 this summer, you know. So, and he was, born in, he was born in 1994, according to the Gregorian calendar. But anyway, so you just shift it by 30, 30 years. But again, um, it's just one of the things that the Lord quickened to me. He says, I, and this was just about three days ago. He says, I want you to read the Gospels between now and Resurrection Sunday. 
I said, okay. And he says, I'm going to show you some things to come. I thought, praise God. I just, I'm expecting, I have this expectation. Well, I started reading first in the Passion at home, and today I started reading here in my New King James at the office. And I realized where I'd gotten to in the, the Passion translation, I'd just gotten through the Beatitudes. And, but then the Lord had me say, I pick up on something right after that, and I'll go to that in just a second, but uh, it's, it has to do with the healing. But remember last week I was saying, really, we, we want to look at some essentials concerning, uh, well, healing, you know, number one, and, and we might find some more fundamentals. Some, what I'm calling tonight, it's a message anyway, is dominion in life through mastering the fundamentals. You know, and you can master the fundamentals, you can master it in sports, you can master the fundamentals in music. We're just talking about learning to be able to master all the fundamentals in music. You know, and, and people want to train themselves in those different things so that they just instantly respond. Musicians want to be able to just play what comes to their mind without having to think about this technique or that. Was it. So you have to kind of practice all these things to be able to get where you can just play what you hear in your, in your head. And I can do that after playing drums for 65 years, but I'm, I'm learning piano right now. It's going to be a long time before I can do that, but Kaya can already do that. Yes, she just flows with what the Lord gives her there. And, um, but, you know, so, but I remember Kenneth Copeland talking about this. He says, well, who are the sports teams that win you know, which football teams win the Super Bowl every year? Well, the two that are in the game are the ones who have mastered the fundamentals the best. And the one who's really done it best usually wins the game. You know, So every now and then you have some just anomaly or something that throws it off. But So anyway, we want to be victorious in life. And so we have to master the fundamentals of the Word of God. Now, when you talk about that for most Christians, they're going to go, oh, okay, we got to master the fundamentals of the new birth and confirmation over and over again that you're born again, you know, reassurance that you're born again. So, well, what about mastering the fundamentals of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Oh, no, they don't want to hear anything about that. Let's see if I can turn this off and go to my, uh, never mind, we'll be okay. <laughs> and, uh, well, how about mastering the fundamentals concerning healing? Mastering the fundamentals, oh, this, this becomes really cultic. The provision of God. Ooh, could you imagine God providing for his kids? Oh, that's just heresy. That's a cult that teaches that. You know? And so what we consider fundamentals, three quarters of the church consider cultic because they don't even deal with it. They, God's fallen off the throne. He can't do that anymore. You know? Somehow, you know, heaven went broke. And you know, God had to hock the pearly gates to pay the mortgage on the throne. So, you know, of course he can't provide for you now. It's like, <laughs> no, everything is fine in heaven. Don't you expect to go to heaven and find everything being fine there? <laughs> well, praise God, it is that way. But when we start thinking about the fundamentals, you know, in the promises in the word of God, it's what, everything that's a promise is what we want to master on. Once you're born again, you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, and you've got a mental assent that everything in God's kingdom is good and he wants to take care of us, you're way down the road, but we still have to master the fundamentals into where basically our life is transformed by the renewing of our mind. Our minds is, is, become so lockstep, in lockstep, with what our spirit believes because the Holy Spirit dwells in there with our spirit. I always like to ask the students, how, many, how much of the word of God do you think the Holy Spirit forgot when he moved into your spirit? <laughs> you know, I mean, because Paul made it plain, we're made with three parts, spirit, soul, and body. So the Holy Spirit, when you get born again, he has to move into one part of your spirit. Has to, I mean, one part of your being. It's not your soul and your body. We know that right away. So it's your spirit. And your spirit has the mind of Christ. Well, when you get your soul in alignment with that, your life starts getting changed or transformed by this renewing of your mind. So again, I went back first to part of the Beatitudes, or right at the very beginning of the Beatitudes. It set it all off because Jesus started his ministry and he was going to teaching, you know, in the synagogues. He called a few of his disciples. And it says here in Matthew chapter 4, Verse 23, then Jesus went about all of Galilee. You know, he set up his headquarters in Capernaum, but he's going all around the Sea of Galilee, all of, you know, that whole Gal Galilean area, teaching in their synagogues. So the Jews had scattered, you know, of course, this is all of Israel. 
and the, the originally Assyrian area, and there, there, there are Jewish synagogues everywhere where the people are going to learn the word of God, be trained. And so Jesus is going teaching in the synagogue and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Well, he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom they'd never heard before <laughs> because they're just, you know, dumbfounded by the wisdom that he has. And he says, well, you've heard it said, but, you know, the founding fathers, they said it a certain way that already messed up what God originally intended. So let me tell you what God really intended. And so he would teach him the truth. And they said, where does this man get all this wisdom about what God really thinks? You know, it's like he must be having one of those bracelets on this is what would God do? <laughs> Instead of a, could you imagine Jesus walking around with a WWGD bracelet? You know, what would God do? <laughs> well, he would know what God would do and he'd know what God would say. And so that's what he said. He said, I only do what God shows me to do. I only say what he says to say. And so anyway, he's a complete reflection of the true gospel. He's preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. So he wanted to teach and preach and get everybody's physical needs taken care of, getting them healed. I mean, there was so much sickness and disease and medical science was not very developed. Luke happened to be a, a doctor, but I mean, they're, you know, they're doing very primitive medicine. And this, and then his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought to him sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments. People were tormented with sickness and disease. When, when, a door, when a disease is tormenting you, it's probably because there's a spirit of infirmity behind the thing. It says these diseases and torments, and those who were, it says here in New King James, demon-possessed, I just say demon-infested. These might have been really nice, kind people, but they were demon-infested with sicknesses that were probably these spirits of infirmity. It says epileptics. They were able to recognize seizures. They said, well, that might be demonic and it might be just natural. We don't know. They saw so many people that had it. Epileptics and paralysis. So paralytics. And he healed them. <laughs> just as he healed, whether it was a demon or what, he healed the people from whatever was ailing them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. Well, if you just think Jesus, is, Jesus Christ is not the same yesterday, today, and forever, you think he can't do that anymore. He can't still heal people. And, of course, a lot of the church would say, well, he can. We just don't know whether he wants to. Except for when you really renew your mind to the Word of God, you look where right after this he comes and he heals a, a leper. As a matter of fact, does the Beatitudes and these. He heals a leper and he says, I know you can heal me if you want to. He says, I do want to, I will, and he heals him. And so he showed the will of the Father. He willed the will of Jesus. It was always God's will to heal people. And so the modern person says, well, yeah, but he'd have to prove that to me because I can't, I can't buy it just because he did it while he was alive. Here, somehow he's limited in being able to do it. No, he gave the same anointing that was on him without measure to the church. And he says, even when the church is doing what I'm telling you to do and people get healed, it's me doing it. I'm the one who doesn't change. God says, I am the Lord who does not change. I change not. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he's still in the healing ministry. He just has to do it through us. Well, I just want to look at this part right after he heals the leper and heals the centurion servant over in chapter 8. Because this is where I got to. And it was like, okay, I was arrested. Because last week I had mentioned Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. We spent some time there. But then we only went to 1 Peter 2, 24. By his stripe you were healed. By his stripe, that one stripe that God the Father laid on him, that we were all healed. It wasn't the multiple stripes on his back given by the Roman soldiers, as horrible as that was. And they beat him nearly to death. And, of course, he was crucified and... And But it was actually having God lay our sickness. God lay first our sin, the cause of sickness. Sin was what crept in and caused poverty, sickness, every kind of animosity, every kind of hatred, everything. Sin caused all of that. It was Adam's original for sin. He said, well, Eve sinned first. You know, Adam was the one who was supposed to keep her from doing that. So that's why he was held accountable. Well, it says here in uh, Matthew chapter 8, starting at verse 16. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed or 
demon infested, probably with sicknesses. Some of them, maybe their minds were obsessed with this as well. To him, uh, who were demon infested, and he cast out the spirits with a word. What was the word that he spoke that cast the demons out? It was probably something like, out, <laughs> or go. <laughs> the authority that's in the name of Jesus, we can use those two same words, out and go, or go in the name of Jesus and out in the name of Jesus. If you want to go ahead and tag it in so everybody knows who's given us the authority to be able to cast demons out. So the, he cast them out with a word and healed all of them who were sick. Now, the reason it's mentioned here, Matthew said, because he does this miraculous thing, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. So what we can gather from that is when Jesus did go to the cross, he took all of our sin, our infirmities, and all of our sicknesses, our infirmities and sicknesses. Well, both of those lumped together. But we know that it was our sin that he had to bear first. So uh, how many of you want to claim the sin that Jesus forgave you of? No, you don't call it my sin. It, like that's, that would still be separating you from God the Father. Jesus took that out of the way so you could be a born-again Christian and the Holy Spirit could dwell in your spirit. Well, how many Christians then talk about their rheumatoid arthritis, talk about their, and they claim all these things that Jesus took so that it's no longer ours, but they claim it as theirs. They don't want to claim the sin, but they'll claim the sickness and the infirmities. Isaiah was pointing that out. I mean, Isaiah and then Matthew's pointing out, Jesus fulfilled what Isaiah said. He himself took our infirmities, bore our sicknesses. Um, <clears throat> anyway, the multitudes came like crazy around him. But anyway, we don't need to claim any of these as ours. Last w week I did say this, Jesus did it all. When we went to, um, when we went to Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, we found out Jesus did it all. I'm going to go back to Isaiah 53, but we're going to read more than just 4 and 5 because I want to see how many times we see this theme represented that Jesus took everything from us so we, it no longer belongs to us. And the fact that we keep claiming it is the reason we keep holding on to it. If we finally get our mouth engaged with where our heart's supposed to be, which the Lord says, it's not yours. Stop claiming it. It'll infest you every time you claim it as yours. So we go back to Isaiah 53, starting at verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Same thing that Matthew was talking about, because griefs is, is translated from the Hebrew to sicknesses. Many times it's translated as sickness and sorrows many times as diseases, and it can include pain or diseases that produce pain. How many of you know that there's a lot of disease that produce a lot of pain? You know, that's why we're so uncomfortable with sickness and disease. You know, if, if you never felt a disease, if God built our bodies where you never felt anything, you'd just be clipping along and all of a sudden you just fall over dead. <laughs> no warning. No warning at all. You know, we, we, our body gives us warning systems. I mean, you know, aren't, aren't you glad you've got a warning system heat? You walk near your stove. You thought you turned everything off and suddenly, you. You feel it hot and said, oh, left that burner on. I need to do that. What if I just had set down some Tupperware on it? Or worse, your hand. <laughs> and the first thing your hand's going to do is just jerk back because you are given all these warning signs. And that's what sickness is in our bodies too. It gives us these warning signs to all the inflammation, all these little pain signals. It's like, better get this checked out. Or go to the Word and pray and see this thing turned around. So again, he bore. Jesus carried them away. He took them. When he went to the cross, on the cross, when God laid our sin on him, he laid all of our sickness on him, all of our poverty on him, all of our division, our lack of peace, our lack of understanding, our lack of anything. I just think about, what if God laid on him all the stupidity of our numbskull heads? I think he did. I think we could have an increase in our IQ because he, he, Jesus bore our dumbness, <laughs> our stupidity, or our cluelessness. 
So let's apply all those things. I'm not going to keep claiming. I, every time I hear somebody gets close to my age, and the Lord just rebuked me about it, don't ever have a senior moment joke again. <laughs> Carol, um, I'm just going blank on her name, up in Chiefland, a pastor friend of ours, just cracked me up at one of our ICFM summits that she was. She says, well, folks, if you want to keep walking in health, stop making old people noises. <laughs> Every time you sit down or get up, you know, oh, uh, you know, it's like, and, it, you, and just, you, it just, you automatically make these noises. You don't realize that's the same thing as saying, it's my sickness, my disease, it's my pains, it's my, it's tough for me to be able to do. Now, I was grumbling the other day trying to get up off the floor after three days of laying flooring. <laughs> I was like, oh, uh, I almost couldn't help it, you know, but then I'm recovered now, so I sneer at making noises getting up from the floor. <laughs> so, you know, the thing is, you don't realize what the devil traps you up in. Now, I realize we're going to be dealing with sub, you know, serious subject matter in the Bible, but you cannot lose your sense of humor. But that's why I think it's okay to laugh at how much we trap ourselves, though, with things that get us in a thought process that says, you know, most people only make it to 85 or 90 yeah, I've had some family members made in 95, but it's probably not going to happen to me. I mean, you know, their mind just goes to that, and it just stays there all the time. Rather than saying, man, I had family members that made it to, you know, I knew on the women's side 101, two of them that I know lived to be 101, my grandmother being one, and then I had a great-great-grandfather that lived to be either 102 or 104. I thought, well, just with natural longevity, it wasn't a big stretch for me to believe that I'm supposed to live to be 105. It just came to my mind that after about a year of being saved, well, I'm supposed to live to be 105. And I didn't know the promises of the Word of God yet. I, wasn't, I was a charismatic, a good charismatic. But you can be a good, clueless charismatic concerning the promises of the Word of God because unless you know that to look in the whole counsel of God's Word and see God says 120 years of the promise, whatever your assignment is, if you're, if you're shooting for that, and those of you streaming, you didn't hear me say, we were celebrating uh, this week. Uh, Chuck Norris turned 84, but he says he feels like he's 48. <laughs> and so he's, he just completed filming a new action movie. It's an action sci-fi movie. I got to see that one. Chuck Norris and a sci-fi movie. Anyway, but as long as it's action, you're going to watch Chuck Norris. Anyway, <laughs> so going back to the Word of God, he bore our griefs carried our sorrows. He bore our sicknesses, carried our diseases and pains, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. That's why he would bore, that was that stripe, that one stripe that Jesus bore where God laid it all on him. He volunteered for that. I'll take on human flesh, Father, and let you lay everybody else's sin and sickness and disease and everything that's bad, lay it upon me, and then I'll exchange that for my righteousness and impart that to them. But Father, we're going to have to renew their minds. That they, got, they, they got their righteousness restored. They got their healing restored. They got their longevity restored. They got their finances restored. They got everything restored. Peace that passes all on us. It's even in this passage here. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. So he bore it all. And so, verse 5 says this, he was wounded for our transgressions, again, we've talked about this many times, he was pierced through for our transgression, which was the sin of revolt, where we suddenly sided in with the devil's revolution against God. That's what Adam did. And he passed that on to us in our DNA. But then, actually, the next verse is what really has to do with what caused us to have our own sins. He says, and he was bruised, that is, he, he was um, crushed for our iniquities, which is perversions. And it just means where we suddenly perverted or changed, twisted somehow God's original plan for the human race and for our individual lives. So once we respond to the human the sin nature, we suddenly pervert the plan of God for our own lives. And so, you know, that's why when we look back and said, man, if I'd only known Jesus when I was two years old, if I'd only been praying in tongues from three on and would have known the word from age four on, I could have avoided all the stupidity that I did in my life. So, well, we weren't there. So what do we have to do? Well, whenever we did come to know Jesus, we had to have it all washed away by the blood of the Lamb. 
But then we've got to wash it out of our minds. I don't know about you, but I, I believe in being brainwashed. You know, my dirty old brain needed a good scrub. And so I like my brain being washed. So then he finishes up the same fifth verse here. Of the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And so we realize again, he, he tied for everything. We, we don't own any part of it. Whenever you say, oh, that really makes me nervous that that's going to happen. Or I'm scared of that. So, well, Jesus bore that. <laughs> Careful what you say. Now, I'm not talking about being a confession monitor for everybody else. Just be a confession monitor for yourself. That's where it's, gonna, that's where it's all going to work is when you monitor everything you're saying. Because if you say something wrong, you say, you know what's out of the abundance of the heart and the mouth speaks? If that's the in the abundance of my heart and I'm speaking that out, I need to change what's in my heart. I got to reprogram myself to the Word of God that gives me all these promises that have to become a reality to me. So then, then they will manifest in my life. We're talking about having dominion in life through mastering the fundamentals of all the promises. All we like sheep have gone astray. This is verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray and have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Father in heaven laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all and everything else that came or was the cause, that iniquity was the cause of. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. And he was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus, he, you know, and that was his disciples really did not understand. He thought he was speaking in parables. He says, you know, I'm going to lay my life down, you know, but I'll take it back up again. And oh, what is he talking about? You know, well, you know, this, you see these buildings, you know, well, this, this temple will be torn down and three days later I'll raise it up. Boy, those are the weirdest parables. You know, they just keep telling you these weird parables about dying and coming back. What does that mean? You know, they just couldn't figure that part out. And then he tells, oh, I'll, he's talking to the scribes, Pharisees, you know, Sadducees, all those doctors of the law. He says, I'm not going to give you guys any sign other than the sign of Jonah, who is three days in the belly of the fish. The son of man will be three days in the belly of the earth. And his disciples are going, what does that parable mean? <laughs> he's like, I'm trying to get this across to you guys. I'm going to bear it all, but hang in there because I'm coming back. <laughs> when I pay the price, I'm coming back. And on my resurrection day, eternal life has been purchased for everyone. And you can receive it from that day forward. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his, this, his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He knew at the time that he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The Father in heaven and the Holy Spirit in heaven had to turn their heads from him, could not look at him, and had to actually walk away and leave him stranded and abandoned. That's when he's hanging on the cross and says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? He was cut off from the land of the living. And from the transgressions of my people, he, for the transgressions of my people, God's saying, he was stricken. Wow, God's saying, he was willing to do this for my family. The, and it was the family that were going to get saved immediately from the people of the nation of Israel. And the family that he really knew was going to come in from the rest of the earth. Because he told Abraham, listen, you go out and try to count the stars. <laughs> you count the sand on the seashore. He says, your descendants are going to be more than all that. Well, that was way more than the nation of Israel. That was from every tribe, nation, tongue, race, kindred, every group of people on the whole planet. And they made his grave with the wicked, verse 9, and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. He was totally, perfectly innocent, but he was crucified as a guilty sinner as one of these wicked rich people, the cabal, you know, the, the ones that hoard all the money to themselves, you know, rip all the people off. He, he, he died and was placed where they go, but not for long. <laughs> he was able to beat the, beat the devil up pretty bad while he's there. Then it tells us in verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased the flop. How could it please the father to do this? He knew 
By doing this, he was redeeming every single one of us who were going to come into the kingdom. And we don't even know how many billions more they're going to come in before God's going to send Jesus back. It may be several billion more. I think we're still going to get to at least 50% of the people on the planet saved before God says, okay, Jesus, go back. We'll leave one there, and you take one with you. <laughs> you know, for each two that are on there, one gets to go to heaven, one doesn't. So once we get to 50%, praise God. It's going to be awesome. So he says, and he has put him to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin. Unfortunately, people say, what do you mean make his soul an offering for sin? Jesus didn't pay this price as the Son of God. As the Son of God, he took on human flesh. He paid the price as the Son of Man. As a human being, he was the only one who could, re could relate to us and the temptation of it, but yet without sin. He was tempted in every way like we were, and he didn't sin, and yet all of this sin came on his soul. That's why in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's sweating blood because he knows he's going to be separated from the Father and the Holy Spirit as the Son of God. But he realizes all sin, all sickness, all disease, and everything is going to be placed on him, and the full weight of it is going to weigh on his soul. His human soul was going to bear the full weight of all of our sin and burden. He shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So he's seeing to the future. He's looking to the future, what was going to be happening here. And then verse 11, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. So the father said, okay, this is going to satisfy all the claims of justice. These, this, people wonder, and they talk all the time about the courts of heaven. This was the courts of heaven. This is where the gavel came down and we were declared innocent, not guilty ever again. This is where the courts of heaven settled the deal. Now, everybody individually, you know, a lot of people don't realize this, that yeah, there's, there's going to be a judgment seat of Christ that every single Christian, you know, faces because we're going to be judged for everything we've done in the flesh as far as whether or not we did what the Lord asked us to do. And there's going to be a Christian saying, well, I never even knew that I was supposed to do something. He says, well, come on in. It's going to be better than being hell. Come on in. <laughs> you know, it makes me think that there's actually going to be different levels in, in hell. Because I was just praying today, you know, I just realized how many people that I already know and have known in my life, some of them that I haven't seen in 50 years or 60 years, you know, that I went to school with, but I know they're already dead. And I don't know. Many of them I know didn't know the Lord. Because a lot of them I worked with for a long time, tried to get them saved. And it wasn't that long after I was no longer working with them that I know that they were dead. Ran into him and just, and, but I said, Lord, certainly there's got to be a lower place in hell for the people like Hitler and those who are just willingly possessed by the devil and all the evil that you could possibly, and just human life meant nothing to them and they destroyed so, so many human souls. And I feel like they're, they're not that we're going to go by Dante's or Inferno, but you know, there's got to be some different levels there. But I, I know for sure we're going to have different levels of reward in heaven. That's why we all stand before the judgment and seat of Christ. Listen, the apostles of the Lamb, there's a reason they're right up there in the 24 around the, the, the throne of the elders, you know, and the founding apostles. And it's like, yeah, we, we laid our lives down for this truth. So the church 2,000 years from now could live by the things that we discovered and established and had written down. Well, guess what? Some of these prophets got these things way before, and that's why Jesus fulfilled all these prophecies. So we could see exactly what God was doing through the whole picture. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. That's finishing of verse 11. It says, uh, verse 11, started with, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. And then by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall, be, shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. So Jesus bore him. So if you bore your sins and you want to forget all about your sins, don't bring up your sickness and don't claim it as yours. Don't bring up your poverty and claim it as yours. Don't bring up your enmity against other people, unforgiveness to other people. <laughs> Throw that off as well. Jesus bore all of it. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. 
and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Jesus made intercession. God was looking for an intercessor. He found him, but not on the earth. He found the volunteer from the word, second person the Godhead in heaven, so I'll take on human flesh. I'll be that intercessor. Now he ever lives to make intercession for us. So there's so much wealth in Psalm, I mean, Isaiah 53. I thought it would be good for us to go back because I, I was just spurred by that again where Matthew says, oh, let me just point out. <laughs> he bore it all. He did it all. Jesus did it all. Don't claim any part of what he paid for you to have done. Now, this may seem like a little bit of a strange departure, but I wanted to go to... Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and <clears throat> no 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and I don't know if I need to back up I'll, I'll, I'll just deal with it let me just deal with the scripture I want to get to um, no actually it's chapter 7 is what I want to go chapter 7 verse 2 now this is Paul writing to the Corinthians, he says, um, he's talking about all these promises we have from the Lord. We'll come back and visit these promises. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. In other words, reverential fear of God, saying, what do we want to do more than anything else? We want to please God. We want to make sure that we're, there's nothing between him and us constantly. And that's why I say every night before you lay your head on your pillow, say, Lord, forgive me. <laughs> Anything I did wrong today, because sometimes I'm clueless. I, I believe you're raising my IQ because you bore that as well. You bore my stupidness. You bore my dumbness. So I'm getting smarter by the minute when I walk with you. <laughs> Thank God for that. <laughs> are you, I, a bunch of us, a bunch of us are going to be claiming that now. Okay. Increased IQ because Jesus bore our dumbness. So anyway, <laughs> that's why Paul, writing to the Galatians, says, you morons. He says, well, look what you, you guys just took your brains out to play with them or something. He says, um, he says listen to this, verse, verse 2. He says, open your hearts to us. Now, these are the words of Paul the apostle who used to kill Christians. We have wronged no one. <laughs> we have corrupted no one. We have cheated no one. I do not say this to condemn, for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. He says, we will die for you. You're in our hearts. You need to understand how much I love you. But he's saying, listen, uh, he says, we have wronged no one. Listen, for Paul to know he has wronged no one and make the same claim of all those that are walking with him, he says, we've been washed of our sin. That's past tense. That's out of our lives. It's not even in the history books. Maybe the history books of earth, but not of heaven. Where God's keeping the real score, there's nothing up there. That's why when a Christian who's done everything they can do and you've walked in repentance, you get to stand before Jesus and he says, Man, there is nothing against you on the record in heaven. <laughs> and look at this. All the marks of all the things that you were asked to do that you did. Wow. Man, you've got a reward waiting for you. It's amazing. In my father's mansion, there's a lot of rooms. You know, it actually just means dwelling places. It might just be your glorified body. I don't know, but it's going to be so good <laughs> being there with the Lord. So now let me just back this up because I want to read the, the precursor to what Paul was saying here when he's talking about the fact that, listen, God is so good and he's given us so much. And we can say because of this washing of our souls from sin, because Jesus bore all of our sin in his soul, we can have a clean conscience before him. So he starts here and, and he's giving instruction to the Corinthians marks of ministry. It says here in ch chapter 6, verse 14, he says, don't, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? He says, you know, 
you're going to be friends with other people. You're going to have people in your own family, but you don't have to do the same things. That the way. He says, he's talking about not having fellowship with their deeds. He says, there's going to be people in your own household maybe that you don't even, I mean, I know so many Christians that, listen, half the people in my house are not born again. As a matter of fact, they're dealing drugs and, you know, it's like, oh, how do you, well, you can separate yourself from doing those same things. You don't judge them. You want to be a light shining in the darkness, and if you don't keep shining in the darkness, staying near them, how are they ever going to see the light? So again, don't be unequally yoked. Now he's saying, though, now when you get married and when you go into business with other people, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. In other words, don't believe on the same level that you believe. And even might be Christians that aren't believing on the same level that you're believing on. What communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Satan? It says Belial, but he's talking about Satan. He says, there is no accord between Christ and Satan. He says, anything that you see that Satan does, run from that as fast as you can. Don't follow any of his footprints. Follow the footprints of Jesus. <laughs> what accord has Christ with Satan? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? There's just really, once you really truly understand that, you realize, my gosh, how, what, how trapped people are when they get saved after they've been married and the other partner never gets saved. And they spend their whole life and says, well, if you have children, your faith can sanctify your children. You can pass on a heritage that can be Christian for a long, even if you can never get that other person saved. But he says, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. <laughs> he says, you wouldn't bring idols into the church sanctuary. So let's just bring in a tiki god and set it up here in front of the cross. <laughs> no. Let's light it on fire in the sanctuary, you know. We don't, yeah, I guess we do have fire alarms in here. <laughs> that would, if you had sprinklers, that would be a mess. So anyway, no, you don't bring any of that. So why would you bring that into your own life? And your body is the temple of the living God. And he says this, this is verse 16, 2 Corinthians. I will dwell in them. I will walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. If you're born again, he's saying, I'm your God and you're my people. I'm walking with you. I'm going to dwell in you. Verse 17 goes on to say this. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Don't touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you. It all comes back to we all need to be re-raised by our heavenly father so we can make up all of our you know, nurturing deficits that everybody has. Just like that commercial. I can't remember what the girl's show she was on, but she says, who's got skin damage? Except for all of us, you know. <laughs> yeah. You don't believe that? Go to a, go to a dermatologist and you're going to say, well, I see a lot of skin damage. Hey, I grew up in Florida on the lakes when I was a kid. I, I lived in a couple of cut, a pair of cutoffs all summer long. Of course, I got a lot of skin damage. But, you know, I don't want to think that. <laughs> He says, I'll be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. He's our father. See, he says, now you've got this new picture. Sons and daughters, and Jesus bore it all. He paid the price for everything. So we come out from the devil's world to be separate and be the sons and the daughters of the Most High God. And one of the things that you have to start realizing you've got to come out from among the world to be separate is this, the way they think. Because they'll all say, well, of course we all have this and that. And, all we, and we say this, and it, we, it, it tries to just suck you right into being trained to think exactly like they, they do. And so much of the church believed from Psalm 90, well, you know, you can live to be 70 if by reason of strength, maybe 80. Well, that was for the backslidden, stiff-necked, rebellious Jews out in the wilderness <laughs> that died way ahead of when they were supposed to die. Go to Psalm 91. With long life, I'll satisfy you and show you my salvation. Same author. <laughs> so I'm going to go with, with long life. I'll satisfy him. I'm going gonna, gonna to come out from among them and be separate. I'm not going to think like they think. I think that's one of the mastering the fundamentals. It's the hardest thing for people to do. So we just can't say what they say. When you watch TV, you're going to see all the drug commercials. And it said, Hey, it's the one drug you got right now working good. You can add this one to it, <laughs> and you'll get twice the effects <laughs> and, and twice the side effects. 
It's like, it's amazing what they can advertise. And everybody goes, well, that's perfectly normal. Listen, once they allow them to start advertising all the drugs, you remember they used to not be able to advertise drugs on television because they knew people would be drawn in. And they said, they go to their doctor. I think I need this drug, and I think I need this drug. Really? Where'd you hear about that? On television. They're advertising it to me now. The doctor's saying, we used to try to keep that a secret from you because we knew of how bad the side effects were going to be. Now people are their own doctors. And so the world's telling you, you can go ahead and do the same thing. Well, I like going to Dr. Jesus and anybody that's really homeopathic, <laughs> alternative in their approach saying, listen, if you can find the things that come from the earth, the nutrients and everything that are in the earth and get those in your body, and you find out what will apply and different things that, you know, you're going to be way down the road. And I, I just believe because it, the primary thing is mastering the fundamentals of faith concerning God wanting to heal us and keep us healthy. And so that we don't claim diseases. We don't claim anything that's ours, you know. Even if we know it's something that's there, it's chronic, you know, and you say, but you know, I don't care if I have to have a surgery to get rid of that. I'll still get rid of it and never claim that it's mine. <laughs> Because I know the mindset God is saying, I need you to look at everything this way. And if it's going to extend your days, then you do whatever it's going to keep extending your days. It's all about running the race, being pleasing to the Lord, and keeping deep fellowship with the Lord. Deep fellowship and deep worship. You know, that's that place where you don't lose your sense of humor. You actually get the joy of the Lord. You know, Paul just... Just let you know a little secret. I've... I've Got a couple more television shows I'm going to write some letters to and send my book to, but but I'm already picturing what I'm going to say <laughs> in some of these television shows. But one of them is just, you know, because I know if I get on that television program, I'll be talking to somebody that knows the word that I have heard sometimes just drop a little um, a truth as a side nugget. Just, you know, just... I'll just drop this on the road, right? It's like the sower goes to sow the seed, you know, and it's the word of God and it just falls on the sides of the road. You know? <laughs> but um, so anyway, some of them will just say things and, and that's maybe you've been in a church service and somebody said something and the lights just came on for you of that and you didn't hear the rest of the sermon because God started talking to you because all of a sudden you got what you were needed out of that one verse of scripture, even though it was just a toss off. It was a toss off. It was just a little, uh, what do they call them? One off, you know, <laughs> side note of, of their message. But anyway, Paul, as he's closing out in First Thessalonians chapter five, he says, um, verse sixteen, rejoice always. Listen, those two words have the secret of happiness in life. Rejoice always. <laughs> Always hold on. Remember, the joy of the Lord is your strength. You're going to need the strength of God to make it through this life. So rejoice always. When he just throws that off, you know, if you just go right to the next one, you go, I just miss that if I just go too fast. <laughs> when you realize there's a whole sermon in each one of them, rejoicing always. The very next one is pray without ceasing. Man, I just wrote a whole new book on pray without ceasing because, I mean, that took me into this place. Was like, you know, if you can think in tongues and According to Psalm 139, 2, God knows every one of your thoughts. And so you can pray in tongues in your mind at all times that you're not having to do, you know, things that you have to be paying attention to and speaking to other people and whatever. You can pick, get in four or five hours a day, six, seven, eight hours a day. You know, kind of start approaching this praying without ceasing. Wow, it just goes on. In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Everything, we're thankful, Lord. It's one of those secrets again, not losing your sense of humor. Be thankful in everything. I mean, in every good thing that he has. In the midst of it, you can still keep your sense of humor. And say, Don't quench the spirit. The spirit of God wants to start moving in you. Go with the flow. Learn the flow. Learn how to go with the flow. <laughs> Do everything you can to learn how to keep flowing with the Holy Spirit. Don't despise prophecies, especially when it's your own prophecies to yourself, when you interpret your own prayer in tongues and suddenly you get to be your own prophet. All these things just kind of keep you. Know, Paul's just throwing this stuff off. And you're going, every one of them is so deep. Test all things, hold fast to that which is good. Yeah, the fundamentals. 
hold fast to the fundamentals. Master the fundamentals. I, told, I just told the students this, this past week, I said, I probably have the best job in the city of Tampa because I my job is to teach the fundamentals that I know to be fundamentals that are the rest of the body of Christ is thinks in cultic. It's just so car, so out there. We realize it's just the promises. <laughs> Teaching these fundamentals over again every single year to a new batch of students. And so it's, they, they just stay fresh with me and I get new things from them all the time. And it's like, that's where I want to stay. I mean, it's like, thank you for that assignment, Lord. Just If I didn't have anybody to teach, I would probably line up a bunch of teddy bears and teach those teddy bears. My 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 little pack of two dogs, you know, they would be listening to me, whatever. I'm going to preach this to somebody because I need the foundation over and over again to master the fundamentals. Test all things and hold fast to that which is good. We start testing everything and realize, man, the good word of God. You find all these scriptures that just, that's why you go back, you create these meditation sheets, all the best of the best, the words that just really speak to you. Abstain from every form of evil. Come out from among them and be separate and you'll be protected it's a good thing. And I just like, I, I added this one to him. Paul, you could have said this one too. Live, wait, live in the glory under an open heaven. That's really where all these things will lead you to. <laughs> and that's why he says in verse 23, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is still coming back. It's just not the way people have figured or when it's people have figured, but he's coming back. It'll be the last day. <laughs> he who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Glory to God. So much in the word of God. So I hope I didn't give you through too much to you choke you on anything, but um, I only had a few scriptures, and we just spent a lot of time looking at that theme over and over again. Don't listen to the world. Come out from among them when they say you have to take this drug, and you have to take this drug, and everybody gets this malady and this sickness, and oh, if it's chronic, you got to have it forever. Listen, I believe this. If you're taking something that's managing symptoms, you still say, while you're taking that, you still and thank you, Lord, that the cause of this is drying up because Jesus is my healer, and he already bore this for me. He's taken it from me. I'm just managing some symptoms, and I don't even know why they're coming in my body, but I, imagine, but I will get to the place where there's no symptoms that have to be managed anymore. <laughs> there's nothing, no, no conditions whatsoever that have to be managed because Jesus bore them all. Praise God. I remember hearing Keith Moore telling people, he says, he learned this while he was a student at Raymond. He was teaching out more and more, but while he was teaching a healing school, his people were coming to him and said, well, you know, I, I just need to, listen, I'm going to need healing from lung cancer if I can't stop smoking. How can you help me stop smoking? He says, well, just do this. Every time you light up a cigarette, say, Lord, I thank you that Jesus died to set me free from smoking, and I've been set free from the addiction of smoking in the, in the name of Jesus. He says, you do that every time you light up. Eventually, you'll look at it and you'll go, thank you that you set, and you'll just throw it away, <laughs> and you'll stop lighting up. And he says, sure enough, he had people coming back to him, and he realized that it was what they put in that replaced that negative thought pattern that changed it to the point where they realized Jesus really did bear it all. He's given me the strength to come out from all of it. So I don't have to buy into any of the lies. No more old people noises. No more senior moment jokes. <laughs> you just go, nope, not going to do it. Not going there. Hallelujah. Got a better way. This is the Lord's way. So I'm going to pray. And I just know that the Lord's going to cause some of these things just to be cemented into our consciousness. So every time that we start to veer off the path, suddenly your soul will say, no, you know better than that. Jesus bore everything. Don't claim your diabetes. Don't claim your lupus. Don't claim whatever it is that you know, people are facing. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, that part of our deliverance from all of the maladies of life that we're going to try to keep us from fulfilling our divine assignment are these things that try to hold us back, keep us 
struggling and in pain. And Lord, we just know that even while we're treating symptoms, we're allowing that. We're not foolish. We know you're not into pain. And sometimes we have to over, override the pain with certain medications. Lord, keep us free, though, from getting addicted to any kind of a pain medicine. And we just declare to you, Lord, because Jesus bore it all, along with our sicknesses, with all of our diseases and pains, he bore our sin. We're not going to claim the sin. We're not going to claim our past sins. We're not going to even claim our sin nature because you gave us a new nature, the nature of God. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God. We're not claiming anything that has anything to do with the kingdom of darkness. We've coming out, we're coming out from among them to think differently, to act differently. We love them. We want them to be born again. We want to train them in the Word of God, build them up in the things of God so that they will be victorious in life as well. We're just not going to do what they do. We're not going to say what they say. We're not going to believe what they believe. We're going to believe the whole counsel of your Word. We're going to believe the moving of the Spirit of God in our lives, that prompting of the Spirit, that flow of the Spirit. We will not quench the Holy Spirit in our lives. We will pray without ceasing. We will rejoice always. We will stay fixed on the mark of fulfilling our divine destinies and purposes, Lord. So in Jesus' name, we just curse any malady that has been in our bodies. We realize now it is no longer ours. It only belongs to Satan. Jesus bore it, but he gave it back to the devil. He bore it so that we won't have to, but he also gave it back to Satan. So Satan, you're welcome to all the sickness and disease you've ever tried to put on us. It's yours now. You I just enjoy suffering with it because I'm not suffering with it any longer. So in Jesus' name, and you just pass it around in all your demonic kingdom, pass it out to fallen angels, you pass it out to fallen demons, Every, everything in the kingdom of darkness, you can have it all. Just don't put it on me. I'm not receiving it. It doesn't belong to me. Healing belongs to me. Provision belongs to me. Peace that passes all understanding belongs to me. It was purchased for me by the very blood of the Lamb of God. When he paid the price for my sin, he paid the price for peace that passes understanding in every area of life. All provision. We claim it all now in Jesus' name. So, Lord, I'm just asking that there, the anointing to master the fundamentals of divine health will come upon each and every one of us. That we'll be just drawn to it. Everything we see on keeping our focus on you and understanding Jesus paid it all so that we do not have to. And getting that transformation, not just in our minds, but in our complete soul. And it'll manifest in our bodies. Our body always comes into agreement. If our spirit and our soul come into lockstep alignment with your will, we know our body has to come into alignment with it as well. So we're looking forward, Lord, to greater health, greater mobility, greater strength, being more free from any sickness, pain, or injury, even injuries that have happened against us. Lord, those things can be corrected and restored with a, even if it requires a creative miracle. Lord, we're total candidates for that. We live in that arena of faith and the moving of the Spirit of God. So we know that at any moment we can have and experience a recreative miracle repairing us from damage so we receive it in Jesus name it's in our pathway it's on our course it will be manifest in our bodies and we give you praise and thanksgiving for it we thank you for it Lord and we just thank you that Father from this hour forward we will be more cognizant of turning all these things back the way you want us to turn them back by being in agreement with your promises. In Jesus' mighty and matchless name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I just remember when um, Fred Price says, I cannot tell you how many healings we've had in our church, Crenshaw, Crenshaw Christian Center. He says, and people think that I have a healing ministry with all these gifts of the Spirit. He says, if I've had anybody healed from one of the gifts of the Spirit operating in my life, I can't tell that. I've prayed for a lot of people, but mostly because I taught them faith first. 
I taught him how to believe God. I taught him what the promises were. And like Jerry Savelle said about Fred Price, after, Jerry, after Fred Price gets through explaining something, if you don't understand it, thou art dumb. <laughs> so you got to start with getting your IQ healed by the Lord first. <laughs> But he saw, it saw so many people healed because he taught them so much about faith. They received healing, just got it and just kept moving on. So half of the time, it's that discipleship. Discipleship is for every area of life. It's not just for do this, do that, so that you look right in front of everybody. You know, it's, no, it's not just, you know, that's, that's um, that can be temperament modification. You know, it's like, well, and I believe in that. I believe you need to modify your temper. Like our friend in a band that I was in, he says, yeah, you know, we're musicians and kind of a temperamental boot group, you know, half temper and half mental. <laughs> it's like, well, I'm not going to claim that anymore. <laughs> I was doing that as Christian musicians. So I'm not claiming being temperamental, half temper and half mental. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're steadfast in faith in the Lord. And that's our story. We're going to stick with it. Amen. So in Jesus' name, we're going to go ahead and worship the Lord with our partnering. I forgot to do that last week. So those of you watching with us online, uh, you can just either use that tithely.com application there. And uh, not that you're tithing to us, but that's just an app for being able to give. And, um, or you can just go to our, one of our websites, lcuonline.com or lcus.edu, and hit the Give button there. And then we're going to pray here. We just believe that in partnering, there's a transfer of the anointing. And a lot of people kind of don't pay attention a lot in the anointing and individual uh, appointments of anointing. I know what the biggest thing is when we have a corporate anointing, we're all together. But you and I live alone a lot. How many of you drive your car all by yourself every day? You know, I do. So I need to know there's an individual anointing for me to drive my car well and stay out of accidents and faith to keep from having accidents and keep myself safe. So it's good to know that we have an individual anointing. We want to walk in the full measure of that. So anyway, we do believe there's an anointing, a corporate anointing on the university and all of our graduates, and you get to partner in with that. So all together, we're, we're a, 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 an army of people that are satisfying their divine assignments. And you want to be able to do that. You want to satisfy your divine assignment so that you can hear those words from the Lord Jesus, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the full measure and the full reward of the joy of your Lord. And so it's going to be one glorious day. So for believers, we work, we, we look forward to that day. Not that we want to die ahead of time, but we want to look forward to that day at the very end of our assignment, running your race all the way to the finish line, and then hearing that from the Lord. So Father, in Jesus' name, as we sow tonight, we trust you that we're going to return. We're going to receive a return on our giving. That's a financial return, and that's wonderful that you do meet all of our needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We're trusting you, Lord, for a return on partnering with the university and the great things that have been taking place. And so many lives, so many, they're transformed, but they become such effective ministers of the gospel. 22,000 of them now, five different continents on this planet, or even more now. I'm not sure. We don't know how to even assess all that, but you know, Lord. And so we know that you're, you're well pleased with people fulfilling what God's called them to do. And so we want to partner with that anointing that's causing people to do that in Jesus' mighty and matchless name. Amen and amen. Bless you and go home happy and rejoicing. Rejoice evermore and pray without ceasing. <laughs>